years. But when you have groups that operate <laughs> under a crucifix, yeah. it makes it extremely difficult to challenge them because you're not a good Christian if you speak up. Hello everyone and welcome to Miked Up, our weekly show where we give you an exclusive in-depth look into some of the biggest issues around the world today. I'm your host Michael Voris and today we're going to be exploring the explosive issue of immigration, both legal and illegal, to find out what this touchy topic is really all about. Now around the world, from Washington DC to Rome, immigration is one of the most hotly debated and fought over issues there is. From the war in Congress over the border wall to Campaign 2020 to church teaching to the open resistance by U.S. bishops to the Trump administration policy to a steady stream of statements from the Vatican, there is nowhere this issue is not front and center. The dynamics at play regarding immigration fold over each other and are both easily obscured, as well as exploited and weaponized in the highly partisan-charged atmosphere we have today. Here's a deeper look. Immigration, one of the hottest topics in America today. I think illegal immigration is a very bad thing for our country. I think open borders are a very bad thing for our country. Separating babies from their mothers is not the answer and is immoral. But the line between legal and illegal immigration is often blurred. First, what is an immigrant? This is defined as a permanent resident alien. So what's an alien? Any person, not a citizen or national of the United States. So an immigrant is simply an alien admitted to the United States as a lawful permanent resident. What's an illegal immigrant? Someone who enters or lives in the United States without official authorization, either by entering illegally or by violating the terms of his or her admission. According to the National Conference of State Legislatures, approximately 300,000 undocumented immigrants enter and stay in the United States each year. The Federation for American Immigration Reform, or FAIR, estimates that as of 2017, there were approximately 12.5 million illegal aliens living in the United States at an annual net cost to U.S. taxpayers of $116 billion. By 2019, the number of illegals was estimated to be 14.3 million with an annual net cost of almost $132 billion. However, in 2018, Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, released a study suggesting the number of illegal immigrants is much higher. The three professors who conducted the research pegged the number at 22.1 million, essentially twice the current widely accepted estimate. Regardless of how many illegals are in the U.S., one thing is certain. Almost a quarter of Americans now view immigration as the most important problem facing the United States. 23% according to Gallup, and that's an all-time high for the polling agency. And the war over immigration has even reached the doors of the Catholic Church. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, or USCCB, continue to push the immigration narrative and they don't appear to be presenting the entire teaching. The Church teaches that the more prosperous nations are obliged, to the extent that they are able, to welcome the foreigner in search of security and the means of livelihood which he cannot find in his country of origin. Public authorities should see to it that the natural right is respected that places a guest under the protection of those who receive him. The cardinal virtue of prudence applies to all this. The more prosperous nations are obliged to the extent that they are able. Well, how able? Well, good Catholics and good citizens can disagree prudentially on just how able we are, but we have the right to set limits, to welcome the foreigner. Now, this foreigner is in search of the security and means of livelihood in our country. We're talking about economic migrants here, and they're looking either for a job or for charity or for welfare as their means of livelihood. So our citizens and taxpayers can prudentially ask, to what extent are we able to provide those jobs or that charity or that welfare? Now, what about respecting the natural right of the guest? That's simple logic. If you invite a guest into your home, he has the right to be treated as your guest. But if he's not invited, if he breaks in, he has no natural right to your home or your goods because you haven't invited him. But he is subject to the law, whether he's invited or not. The rest of this teaching states, political authorities for the sake of the common good for which they are responsible may make the exercise of the right to immigrate subject to various juridical conditions, especially with regard to the immigrants' duties toward their country of adoption. 
Immigrants are obliged to respect with gratitude the material and spiritual heritage of the country that receives them, to obey its laws, and to assist in carrying civic burdens. Now, the second paragraph is the one that the bishops disagree with so much that they leave it off their website and have done so for years. It's our country's political authorities that make laws, that's what it tells us, defining the proper way to immigrate into our country. While the catechism doesn't say it, the ability to leave your country to emigrate is a natural right. You can get out of East Germany if you can, but to immigrate into another country is not a natural right, it's a privilege that is governed by that country's law. Now, the Catechism addresses not the new immigrants' rights, but their duties in this paragraph. These duties include to be respectful and grateful for the material and spiritual heritage of the host country. That means the duty to obey all of its laws, including immigration law, and to assist in carrying civic burdens, not according to the corrupt culture of their home country, but according to the common good as recognized and honored by the citizens here at home. A year ago, Pope Francis said, he who raises a wall ends up a prisoner of the wall he erected. That's a universal law in the social order and in the personal one. If you raise a wall between people, you end up a prisoner of that wall you raised. In 2017, Bishop of San Diego, Robert McElroy, told the World Meeting of Popular Movements, well now, we must all become disruptors. We must disrupt those who would seek to send troops into our streets to deport the undocumented, to rip mothers and fathers from their families. The USCCB stands opposed to U.S. immigration policy. The conference has issued statement after statement condemning current policy on deportation, sanctuary cities, and the southern border wall. Over the decades, the bishops have raked in billions from taxpayers, money given to them by Uncle Sam to fund migrant and refugee services. In 2013, the bishops received nearly $74 million from the government, nearly 32% of their total conference budget. In 2014, the figure leapt to nearly $80 million, almost 33% of their budget. In 2015, the total climbed to over $80 million, nearly 38% of the USCCB budget. And in 2016, the American prelates pocketed over $95 million, nearly 39% of their total budget. In 2018, the USCCB's total budget was 40% taxpayer funded. That's a real fingerprint of Leviathan on our church is that almost half the activities of our bishops are secular because they're federally funded. Not teaching doctrine, you're not doing pro-life work, you're not saving babies, you're not, none of that. You're only doing what the federal government orders you to do in order to spend its money. Otherwise, they would take the money away. They're strongly motivated to increase the number of immigrants who come to the country because the, the, they run their operation largely off the profit they make charging the federal government for these contracts. Some of the main entities funded by U.S. tax dollars doled out to the bishops are Migration and Refugee Services, Justice for Immigrants, Catholic Campaign for Human Development, Catholic Legal Immigration Network, Catholic Relief Services, and Catholic Charities. Two of these are on the national collection schedule for the next two years. The Catholic Relief Services collection is on the schedule twice this year. One on March 22nd, and the other goes all throughout Lent. The Catholic Campaign for Human Development collection is on November 22nd. Another one on the schedule is the Peters Pence Collection, scheduled for June 28th. This collection is supposed to provide emergency financial assistance to aid the neediest throughout the world. Last year, a half a million, $500,000 from the Peters Pence Collection was joined with money from George Soros funding agencies and given to the immigrant caravans as they headed towards the U.S.-Mexico border. In contrast, not one of the 15 scheduled collections for each of the next two years will go to fighting abortion, and that is in keeping with USCCB history. In its 50 years of existence, the bishops have not taken up one collection out of hundreds of national collections specifically slated to fight abortion. Not one. Last year, at the November USCCB General Assembly, 69 of 212 bishops, about a third, voted against language declaring abortion as the preeminent issue we face today, going against their own voter's guide, which states that the threat of abortion remains our preeminent priority. The church is becoming an adjunct of the federal leviathan 
and therefore of the Democratic Party. When our bishops pretend that deporting an illegal immigrant is like aborting a child, and the Bishop of El Paso said it's the same thing, well, that's outrageous. That's pretending that Mexico is like a medical waste dump where dead babies get put after an abortion. It's absolutely outrageous to pretend that immigration is a life issue. That's just to play into Cardinal Bernadine's corrupt, seamless garment. Every time an illegal immigrant crosses the border, the bishops cash a check. That's not true when you save a baby in an abortion clinic. They don't get anything. I wish we could find some way to financially incentivize the bishops to make them want to save babies the way they want to bring immigrants into the country. Living in the time we do, people need to step up and fight for truth without worrying about political correctness. Today's guest, Michelle Malkin, wrote a book exposing the corruption of the immigration issue, Open Borders, Inc., who's funding America's destruction. Michelle's been unapologetically fighting this fight all over the country for decades now. Her zeal has led her to being banned and censored many times over the years. She even spoke at the Conservative Political Action Conference last year, but wasn't formally invited back. So this year, she spoke at a smaller conference instead. Michelle recently visited our Church Milton studios here in Metro Detroit and granted us an interview where she had some very revealing insights into the role played by the U.S. bishops in the whole immigration drama. We'll have that for you right after this. In these dark times, fill your home with the beauty of the faith. Visit our store online at store.churchmilitant.com. All right, Michelle, thank you for coming to the studio. Appreciate it. It's kind of nice here, huh? It, it is an honor to be with you, Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah, that's very kind. Thank you. Uh, all right, listen, let's start, go straight into your Open Borders, Inc. book, mm -hmm. uh, particularly that you've got a whole chapter there, more dedicated to the, the corruption of the stealing it's just stealing because it's false. It's falsely presented. The stealing of American tax dollars by the U.S. bishops and all kinds of organizations. We have some of them here on the uh, various organizations that do all of this broken immigration work and shuffling people across borders and all of this. Uh, this entire thing is really has the U.S. bishops conference sort of the tip of the spear. Right? Yes, it, it's true. And when I use the word Open Borders Incorporated, it certainly suggests, I think, to the average layperson who pays attention to politics that I'm talking about big business or that I'm talking about political machines. Mm -hmm. But what was truly shocking to me when I was putting it all down on paper was the depths and the reach and the extent to which the Catholic Church is at the forefront. They are on the board of directors of, of Open Borders Incorporated. And I've reported on various aspects of the nonprofit, tax exempt charities that operate under the US Conference of Catholic Bishops. But um, connecting all of the dots and following the money and finding the truth, which is my investigative mantra for so much of, of my work. Um, even sort of shook me, yeah. uh, and and that was know. our same experience here. <laughs> yeah, we right? sort of just started discovering this around 2009 or 10, and we saw the connections back to Saul Linsky and the community organizing thing, and they propped up Obama back in the day when he was a yes. community organizer. I mean, the church paid for him to become a community organizer. Yes, and yeah. of course, Church Militant has been covering these issues for years, and in a sense, you must feel like Cassandra is just sort of <laughs> warning and getting, hey, people, yeah, look at this, look at this, us. Part, right? <laughs> and uh, of course, I have the, the, the zeal of a Cassandra Andrew now myself, you know, we've got to do something about this before it's too late. Yeah. I think what's been illuminating to me and encouraging is hearing from, you know, my sort of mainstream audience, the people that have followed me on mainstream cable TV or read my newspaper columns, coming out of the closet in a sense and saying, I know, I know, I've tried to do something in my sort of, uh, you know, daily existence as, as a Catholic to push back, we need help. Uh, people want to do something about it. But I think um, as a journalist uh, and as a Catholic and as an American nationalist, 
what I can do is bring the, the data and bring the information to the table and, and name the names, which we have to do. Um, a lot of people don't even understand that. Um, well, this is an extensive web. Yes, it network. is. It is. And, and people still imbue these nonprofits with such um, white hat morality. Correct. Not Good knowing job. that the entire web is essentially running a global human smuggling racket that is inducing so much suffering, that is incentivizing poor people around the world to risk their lives and risk their families to break our laws and then to fundally, tr fundamentally transform the uh, American experiment without any sense of, of input from the people who are already here. So it's one thing to talk about, say, George Soros money or to talk about left-wing groups or um, identity politics uh, organizations that are subverting our sovereignty and, and undermining our borders. But when you have groups that operate <laughs> under a crucifix, yeah. it makes it extremely difficult to challenge them because you're not a good Christian if you speak up. Right, exactly, exactly. And I think one of the things that lots of people are just waking up to, I think they began to wake up probably in 2016, <clears throat> excuse me, but when you look at, uh, as we get closer now to 2020, all this stuff is out there now. It's all out there. We've been pounding the drums. People get it. You know, uh, it, it was... A very interesting thing that Trump said back in 16, he goes, nobody would be talking about immigration if it weren't for me. That. And and he's right. So what that has done has kind of taken the veil off of the marriage between the Democratic Party and its money and the U.S. Bishops Conference wanting that money and pushing the same agenda. I mean, there's not really, you know, William Simon Reagan's... Uh, Treasury Secretary said uh, the U.S. bishops are really little else than the Democratic Party of prayer. Yes. And, and, you know, that's... Uh, that's so right. <laughs> it's right. So go into us for a little bit here when we talk about this. First of all, there's a level of hypocrisy, isn't there? I mean, and we can start in Rome. You know, no walls, get her walls, walls are bad. Uh, have you been to Rome? Yeah, that's right, we're looking up at the, you, <laughs> you can't know. get over the wall. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, you know, look at that and you say, you know... Uh, um, uh, you know the, the 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 big migrant caravan, for example. Mm -hmm. You know that made news back in you know a couple of years ago, and then again. And you know these just thousands of people. <clears throat> they originate in uh, one of the caravans originates in Honduras. That is the uh, headquarters for uh, Cardinal Mardiaga, Pope's right hand man uh, in Tegucigalpa. And all of a sudden, you've got to ask yourself, how did thousands of people walk <laughs> all that distance yes uh you know and there's just sort of basic human needs that you have to deal with you know, where are you sleeping where are you obviously taking care of business where's all this happening how are you where are you getting your water from uh you're really going to drag your four-year-old little child you know walk thousands of miles what when the, if it's raining do they have to lay on the ground and sleep how's this happening and we come to find out last year that the Pope gave half a million dollars. The Pope, yes, uh, from the Peter's Pence collection, yes, correct, gives yeah. a half a million dollars to help fund that, along with George Soros and and the whole bit. Right. I, I think Catholics are flabbergasted, good Catholics, who don't want this to be the case. All this evil stuff in the hierarchy and all that. They don't want to be. It's, it's no. I don't want this to be the case. No, no. Hear no evil. See no evil. And yet it is there, and it is evil, yeah. because they're presenting something as kind of a Catholic teaching when it's actually not a Catholic teaching. Yes, exactly. Again, the extent of it is what's flabbergasting. And so I went to great lengths to paint the picture of this entire network of shelters and aiders and abettors along the way, from de Cusigalpa all the way um, into Mexico, up the spine of Mexico. And I half joked, that you know, soon there's going to be Yelp and TripAdvisor reviews for all of these places along the way, and you know we have very clear laws against aiding, abetting, sheltering, and harboring people who are lawbreakers in this country, and yet it happens every day that flagrantly um, Catholic elitist open borders activists on both sides of our uh, the southern border are shipping you know, large portions of Central America and Mexico into our country to the detriment of the people who are already here. 
And, you know, we can talk about the, the warping of Scripture, and particularly by the head of the Catholic Church, <laughs> every single day who's anointed himself, uh, you know, the, the global leader of the tr anti-Trump resistance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what does it mean for the danger to our economic well-being, our national security, the futures of our own children mm -hmm. here? Um, so, and of course, that's just one aspect of it. And I think that, again, for just speaking for my sort of normal audience that I've had for the last 25 plus years, they understand uh, somewhat a level of the Catholic Church's role in aiding and abetting illegal immigration. But mm -hmm. it's also the legal channels, the legal channels uh, through which the Catholic Church is importing um, much of the of the of the third world into our country through the refugee resettlement program, which they get paid millions of dollars for. Billions, we're yeah. we're talking about now. And President Trump, of course, took a very very important step to try and restore local control over these decisions. Most people will look around. I mean, we don't have to go very far here in Michigan to see the transformation of of, of neighborhoods. Um, where citizens had no input into that process. And yet, despite this executive order, which is a gift for American sovereignty, you have so many Republicans who are supporting the refugee resettlement racket um, in cahoots with the Conference of, of Catholic Bishops and a number of other faith groups that are making mint off of it. Let's, let's talk about the Bishops' Conference for a moment. Yes. You know, they get together twice a year. You know, the spring-ish, you know, early summer, and then in the in the winter, in November, and uh, and in between time when they are uh, not gathered together as a body, but they're out in their uh, respective dioceses, the uh, their staff back there, which is a multi-hundred million dollar bureaucracy, is constantly issuing these statements. Yes. You know, an enormous number of them on the political front go after Trump. Yes. I, mean, they, I think the whole Catholic media world stopped when it was, uh, I don't know, a couple weeks ago. Was it, I can't remember what, the, what they said, but, you know, this is a good thing for Trump to do whatever. Something, I think it was something to do with about abortion, but I can't remember exactly. But whatever. That's the first positive statement, I, I think, in his presidency that they've, they've issued. Every single time he touches one of their sacred cows, yeah. they come out and they blast him. Yeah. Uh, and statements, and, you know, it's on this and that, you know, and Pope Francis, you know, it's unchristian to build a wall, even though you live behind one. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, you know, speak to a little bit about that, because, you, know, you know, what's happened with the Bishop's Conference, you know, the, you get a marvelous section in the book, and people need to read this book. And they need to read this book and understand what's going on with the immigration issue. Yes. You've got a wonderful thing saying there, the Bishop's Conference started out as a way to help Catholic soldiers coming back from World War One. Isn't that mind-boggling? That Catholic American yes. soldiers coming back from World War One. Yes. And now it's turned into this, you know, George Soros, you know, subsidiary. Transnationalist advocacy group, essentially. And and it and it is not hyperbolic to observe that pretty much every day and pretty much every week they're out with these statements haranguing the Trump administration every time it tries to wrest control back in favor of American sovereignty. Many of these Catholic groups with the uh, either explicit or implicit blessing of the conference uh, of, of bishops uh, is out there with press releases on behalf of these open borders lawyers who are bringing lawsuits on behalf of illegal aliens and other foreigners as if they have some God-given right or entitlement to come into our country at any time for any reason. Um, they're up there on the, the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court. They're marching in the uh, halls of, of, of Congress, and they make common cause with uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the Koch brothers, um, the libertarian open borders, right, and then uh, move on, and, the, and these ethnic groups, uh, Unidos U.S., um, CARE, the Council on American-Islamic Relations, um, to do everything they can in their power to change the composition of our country mm -hmm. as a way to gain control. When you look ahead to 2020, to the election in 2020, there is... There was that sort of stunning moment on the debate stage. Uh, remember where the, where the debate was, and when there were like 87 of them still, still in the <laughs> yeah, race. Right. And the moderator asked the question, 
how many of you would be in favor of uh, paying, uh, you know, health care costs for illegal immigrants? Yes. A couple of people hesitated for just a second, yes. kind of looked around, yes. but within a second or two, every single hand was yes. up that they will take your American paid tax dollars as an American worker and they will pay for health care for illegal immigrants, not immigrants. My mother's an immigrant. Yes. No problem with immigrants. We have immigrants who work here. No problem with immigrants. But every one of them that came here, including my mom, did it the right legal way. That's stunning. Yes. Do you think Americans are ready to hear that? And the bishops back that. Of course they do. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, that's more money for them. Yes. Ching, 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 ching. Oh yeah, that's right. The do you think America's ready for that? Do you think Americans, as a country, are gonna that that comes up as an issue? Because you know, yeah. whoever it is, especially if it's Bernie, yeah, Trump is gonna say in that debate, you want to take everybody's money, you want to cancel their health care, give them a Medicare thing. Oh, and by the way, you want to pay for all the illegal immigrants. There's like 18, 20 million, whatever it is now. Yeah. How do you think that's gonna fly in America yeah, overall? Yeah, that that's a bridge too far. And the blatant lying and deception is useful to us, of course, because right on the one uh, side of the split, split screen, you've got all of those hands up. Now, right. some are much higher than others, but they're all up, right? right? And then we have the scene from just last week at the State of the Union address when Trump called out the Democrats for all supporting uh, illegal alien health care subsidies and Nancy Pelosi mouthing the words, not true, yeah. not true. <laughs> right? uh, it was true, Nancy. Yes, that's right. Fact check. <laughs> Fact check. Um, so on, on even as fundamental issue as that, we know that we have a majority of Americans who are going to be on the right side with Donald Trump. And despite all of the propagandizing from the Catholic elite leadership, rank and file Catholics don't want that either. Um, and so then we have to move towards some of these trickier areas. And I come back to refugee resettlement mm -hmm. because when people understand that this is a billion dollar business, when people understand that it has a palpable and visceral effect in their communities, it affects their schools, it affects their health care, yeah. welfare, it, it, it affects public safety, it affects the cultural and civic fabric of this nation. Then I think what you see is an enlightenment and I think an emboldening among patriots who are willing to resist, if you want to use a, a popular word. And I did highlight a number of um, cities across the country that have been transformed in this manner. And I think Michigan, obviously, is a huge hotbed of that. I'm and sure. Minnesota as yeah. well. Um, and I think the Twin Cities is really ground zero for mm -hmm. um, just how detrimental the refugee resettlement racket has been. Um, and other areas of the country don't want to turn into that, just like, you know, the rest of the country doesn't want to turn into California either. <laughs> you, you highlight in your book when the, uh, you know, uh, giving two motives why the bishops are so gung-ho uh, about this, obviously getting tax dollars to, you know, fund the programs. And of course, they have to use some of that for administrations. They have to keep their bureaucracy going. But aside from that, uh, you know, white white European descendants uh, of the immigrant waves uh, are a dismal number of people going to Mass now on mm -hmm. Sundays. There's not active Catholics anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second reason is if you put bodies in the pews, you get money in the plate. So uh, I, it's a very interesting spin. I hadn't heard it put that way before. Obviously, getting the federal largesse is awesome, so yes. let's keep the machine going. But the idea of replacing the uh, shrinking white European, Irish, Italian, whatever, Polish Catholic crowd here with a Hispanic crowd that gets the jobs, illegals I'm talking about. Yes. They get the jobs and then they're able to throw money in the plate and make up for the loss. So it's numbers and money. That yes. was a very interesting tie-in. Yes, and, and, and it is a very insidious kind of replacement theory that's being put into action. And of course, I get called a conspiracy theorist all the time for connecting the dots and telling the truth. Um, and so what happens, of course, is you're talking about billions of dollars of, that is reaped by low-wage workers who can then fill the plates and then, of course, send a lot of that money back to their home countries in remittances. And President Trump has promised over the last almost four years now to tax remittances, mm -hmm. which would be you know, a very direct way of disincentivizing um, the cheap labor uh, racket and, you know, getting at 
pushing back against the cheap labor lobby. But it's interesting because I've had a number of people who've been following this over the years point out that it is a very mm, penny-wise, pound-foolish investment that the church is making because, in fact, newer waves and generations of the illegal aliens who are coming from Central and South America may come to uh, their local Catholic diocese for, I don't know, a year or something, but they're not staying. That's it. They yeah. leave the, I, we, in a, some of our earlier research on this topic, we found that uh, within the first generation, 50% of the children are no longer practicing, when they grow up, are yes. no longer practicing Catholics. Yes. 50%. And the waves that keep sort of coming over year by year are less and less practicing Catholic. So literally diminishing returns. <laughs> Absolutely. The more you bring over, the less Catholic they are. Well, if your whole point is to try to fill the coffers and fill the seats and the pews, yes. you will, you know, you're not doing that. About the only thing they can do really effectively is cover up sex abuse. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that is so, true. <laughs> ooh, yeah. Sorry. That was yeah. a little, uh, <laughs> however true. Um, talk to me for a moment about how, uh, going back to the caravans, the caravans coming here. How are how is all that happening logistically? How is it happening? How are you bringing over thousands? I mean, you just think about thousands of people standing around at you know a college football game. Yeah. There's porta potties all over the place. There's stands. There's just shirts. There's you know there's organization involved in all of it. And how is that happening? How, you just look at it and think, oh yeah, it's a caravan. You see it for ten seconds, but you don't think about well, it's nighttime. How are they going to feed? Where, where, how are they getting, you know, formula for the babies? And what's going on? Well, it's very high tech. Yeah. There are, there's an app for that, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> um, and there are all sorts of organizational methods by which these uh, decidedly non-organic movements are taking place. And, of course, we've seen over the years, um, well before Trump had gotten the insight to make immigration a, a winning campaign issue, that... Every Easter, every Thanksgiving, every Christmas, uh, these things would spring into immediate action. And you had a system of Sherpas, essentially, yeah. guiding them from the initial bus stops in Honduras. Uh, and then um, the guides, the shelter networks. And there are, you know, AP and Getty Image photographers that uh, come along with them, right? Mm -hmm. You know how in um, Iraq and Afghanistan, the military allowed embedded journalists mm -hmm. to accompany them? Well, the same thing. And so, uh, you know, whether it's Ireneo Mujica, who of course is the most famous of, of these caravan organizers for Pueblos and Fronteras, or any of the, the lesser organizations that are involved, uh, between all of the Catholic organizations, and whether it's the Jesuit Ref Refugee Service or whether it's the Scalabrinians or any number of these uh, shelters that have been in place now for 20 years, I mean, the first one, I think, was funded by the Peters Pence Fund mm -hmm. 12 years ago, right. 12 years ago, um, working in conjunction uh, with government officials from Central America and Mexico, um, as well as all of the usual suspects on, uh, in the Soros world. So uh, Doctors Without Borders and um, Mi Gente, um, and then the legal network, once you, you know, get, you know, to get across the finish line. And then, of course, all of the illicit players in all of this with the drug cartels and the coyotes and uh, the people who are paying for advertisements back in, in Central America to let them know now's the time to go. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, it's so insidious because it's portrayed in the media as, oh, here's, a, you know, here's the Jews leaving Egypt. Yes. Oh, and it's actually a, a, a well-orchestrated, well-planned, well-timed political organization doing its thing as a big giant photo op. Yes, yes. And so, you know, the optics and the media coverage um, also help enable and promote this entire racket. And it's incredibly difficult for truth tellers, whether yeah. it's you at Church Militant or, you know, individual journalists like myself, uh, to push back against Hollywood. Yeah. Uh, and um, the, the straight out lies about you know, when the cages and the separation of families began, right? Even, even that alone. And then the storylines that are plied 
on TV, not only just in the nightly news, but in entertainment shows, on late night comedy shows, over and over and over again. Um, and so there, the narrative of separation of, of families, I think, needs to be turned on its head, because what could be more unholy than the separation of American families at the altar of, of open borders and, and uh, you know, the suffering that they have to endure, as well as the demonization for speaking up about it? Why, why do you think that the... Uh, is all of this really just a response to Trump? Uh, the you know the media going mad and the whole bit because look we've we've seen the videos a thousand times of uh, you know of, of Obama standing there saying close the borders and blah and immigration and yeah. ship them home and Bill Clinton blah, blah, blah. but Trump says it and it, it it it's like somebody just filled the room with you know cyanide and yeah. they go nuts yeah <laughs> what is it about Trump it doesn't matter what issue we're talking about immigration but yeah. what is it about Trump that sends them just out of their minds. What is it? He's, He's saying some of the same things they pitched yes. <laughs> for decades. Yes. But when he says it, it's, oh, it's evil. Well, they're all dissimulators, whether we're talking about Democrats who grudgingly paid lip service to uh, securing the border at every election time, or the you know untold myriad numbers of Republicans who are just as much guilty as dissimulation. Pretty much every other modern GOP presidential candidate, certainly in the 25 years that I've been doing this, um, has been a tool of open borders and stabbed American sovereignty in the back once they were well ensconced in the Beltway Swamp. And for once, we had a candidate who was not con controlled by any of those forces. It made him the chaos candidate in the way because <laughs> Sometimes he says it, sometimes he implements it, and then sometimes he, you know, goes back two steps and then, you know, one step forward sure. um, with regard to just the general agenda and the importance of controlling mass migration. Right. Um, and so, yes, so the, the, the Trump derangement syndrome um, showed sort of the escalation of panic among all of these special interests, but it's not like it didn't exist before. And I think the chapter in Open Borders Incorporated about the Southern Poverty Law Center and its long war on nationalists and um, their smear campaigns, um, particularly against people of faith who also happen to be nationalists. Yeah, they hate our guts. <laughs> yeah, there, there you go. We're on the map. You hoo I mean, you're not doing it right if you're not on the SPLC yeah, you, hate you, map. When you die, if you go stand in front of our Lord and you don't have a, hey, here we're SPLC, they, <laughs> yeah, we, we, right. they hate us, you're, you're in deep trouble. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it, is, it, is a, uh, it is a badge of, of, of honor for sure. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think... I think I worry in a way because Trump has so much that he's up against. Mm -hmm. It's the deep swamp. It's the uh, deep state. It's the uh, deep swamp. That, I, that's, 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 that's what that's we should you call should, it, right? You should coin, that. You <laughs> got it. Heard it here. That. Heard it here. Yeah, that's, that's right. Church Milton, first yeah. time, Michelle. Yeah, right. It'll be the Urban <laughs> Dictionary. Um, the the deep state and uh, you know all the forces that have been at work basically since 1965 to change our country. And I think what people are understanding now, especially when Virginia went blue, is that it's all about math, as we joked earlier, off air. Right. This is math. It is math. It's just math. And I can remember, you know, I've been in, you know, professionally in this since 1983. The very first thing I did in news was work on Campaign 84 with Reagan and uh, Reagan yes. Mondale uh, when I was at CBS News in New York. And Virginia was as red as blood. Yes. And it has been completely flipped in those 30 years. Yes, that's right. These things don't happen by accident. No. And they're not going to be combated by simply sitting on the sidelines uh, for fear of being called a racist or a nativist or a xenophobe or anti-Catholic or anti-Jewish or anti-Muslim or, or whatever. Right. Um, and I cut my teeth in Los Angeles in the early 1990s. I was there for the passage of Proposition 187, which was really the last time that we saw a, a, a large, significant grassroots movement mm -hmm. um, on behalf of um, American citizens, the nickname of that initiative was Save Our State. Yeah. And so, well, California is lost, and so the mission for the rest of us, and especially Catholics who understand everything that's going on, is to save our country. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, save the nation. Absolutely. Uh, 
two final questions. One, theology, Catholic. You're Catholic, so everybody knows. You go to Mass, you believe the teachings of the Church, mm-hmm. all that. Okay. Do you, uh, what's your personal, not necessarily your Michelle Alkin, but your Michelle. <laughs> Michelle Alkin's right for some. Thought, when you look at and you hear all of this evil in the Church, not just the sex abuse covers up, not just all of this, but the, look, the, the complete meltdown of the faith. The refusal to ever have any of the leaders really ever say anything about abortion. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's like President Trump <laughs> is the best Catholic bishop there yes. seems to be. Yes, yes. Um, and he's pro-gay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a great question. And there's a parallel questioning and sort of self-reflection that's going on in the conservative movement writ large. Mm -hmm. What exactly are we conserving? Right. And I think when I look at the corruption in the Catholic Church, I apply that that same analysis. And it's really difficult not to be black-pilled is the term, right? It's really difficult not to feel like all hope is lost. Um, But, you know, I just maintain a strong faith. I know that there are so many of us out there um, Just need and, to connect. Yes, and 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 that's huge. And and you know, I always marvel at sort of the providential way that um, these paths have been paved. Um, and I'll tell you that my greatest hope lies in the young people that I've met that self-identify as traditional Catholic Americans. Yes. And I'm seeing it. I, I've traveled a lot over the last six months, and especially on college campuses, and the bravery and courage with which these traditional Catholic Americans um, are fighting these battles now, that is my greatest hope. And they are not identified as one party or the other. Right. It, it, you know, it is a, it is a trans-party revolution that's going on to take back their church and our country. Yeah, there's this striking parallel in the political world and the Catholic Church. Yes. It's just this tracks just running along with each other. Even the ties are the same. Yes. All the same issues, everything. It's, yes, that's it's, right. Whether it's life, whether it's you know seeing this proliferation of the the drag queen hours in the in the libraries. A lot of these kids don't have kids yet, but they feel it. They know that they are the ones that have to stand up there. And we've seen some of these videos of them, you know, going their boots on the ground. Yeah. That's what we need. Some of those guys are actually working here. Yes. <laughs> right yes. behind the cameras, as a matter of fact, and in the control room. Um, okay, so last question. Crystal ball time. Do you have it? Is it out? Is it all polished? <sighs> <laughs> All right. Go for it. Who do you think? Well, first, let me ask you: How do you think the Democratic National Convention will go? Well, I mean, of course, <clears throat> broker, we're, broker? we're hearing bro- brokered convention, okay. right? And you know, they want to screw Bernie. You, they that, do not want Bernie. So, what's happening now is what happened within the Republican Party four years ago: that there is this reckoning. You mm-hmm. know, that there is the showdown now between the gatekeepers, the elites. Uh, and the grassroots of the party. And I find it fascinating. I don't know which way it's going to go, but yes, I see a broker convention. Um, but, you know, the same way that so many young people, the MAGA types, were, you know, the, the, the fuel for the Trump fire, mm-hmm. I think it's going to happen there too. And, you know, uh, they may not have the money, and they may not have the, the, the power and the leverage, um, but he's inspiring them. <laughs> Rachel Maddow said on a show the other day, uh, one of her <laughs> crazy shows, <laughs> she said, well, you know, we need this, 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 we've got all this, and we get the power, we get the view, the enthusiasm, which sort of they don't. Yeah. Um, we just don't have the champion. Yeah. <laughs> and as you look down the road, and you look at, you know, Bernie and Elizabeth and, you know, all, you know, Joe and all of them and everything else, he goes, I just don't know we have the champion. Yeah. You needed somebody like Trump to sort of just stride onto the stage and pardon my crassness here, but just sort of give the establishment the bird. Yeah. And that's what he did. And people went, yeah! Yeah. I, I don't think there's necessarily that sort of sense. There's certainly, I agree with, <laughs> it's probably the only time I'll ever say it, I agree with Rachel Maddow. There is no champion over there. No. So the broker convention, who comes out of it? Bernie? Uh, Bernie. I, I think it's going to be Bernie. Look, um, the establishment has thrown every pathetic billionaire they can scrape up. Right now they're on Michael Bloomberg. Be- yeah. be- before, Racist. Right? Right? <laughs> Racist. Before it was Tom Steyer yep. and um, 
you know, they're just going to keep doing that. It's not going to work. So Bernie and then, I mean, you asked me who I think is going to be president. I, I firmly believe that we will get a second term of, of President Trump, God willing. Yeah, I, I, as it looks right now, I mean, you have a party imploding. Yes. That's never good. <laughs> and you don't stand in the way of it, right? It's like, no, no, you sit back, get right? your popcorn, yeah. put your feet up, have your doggy by your feet, just say, <laughs> yeah, hey, watch right. this, watch this, boy. <laughs> Better than Netflix. <laughs> it's fantastic programming. Yeah. Michelle, is there anything I should have asked you or anything else you want to say? No, I just, I feel very blessed to know you now, to have connected in person and keep doing the great work that you're doing. Well, right back at you. Thank you. All right. God bless. Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Mike. You're welcome. Resist. What does it mean to you? To resist is to battle. Many find themselves fighting this battle alone. As if she is the last Catholic in her diocese. This couldn't be further from the truth. Nonetheless, it's a concern many people have. Because of this, Church Militant wants to create an opportunity for Catholics to unite in their fight for the restoration of Holy Mother Church. It's time to meet the enemy at the front gates and blow his smoke from the sanctuary. Resistance is a grassroots operation to help you learn the riches of the faith, increase in holiness, strive for strong virtue, and combat the heresies and abuses that have infiltrated the church. The first step is to join the resistance chapter that is in your diocese. The apostles didn't spread the faith alone. Neither should you. Pope St. John Paul II said it best, The love of Christ does not distract us from interest in others, but rather invites us to responsibility for them, to the exclusion of no one. We want you to grow in your faith together and individually. The Life of Christ, City of God, and Confessions are books you can interpret together, just as iron sharpens iron. Know your faith intellectually, and you may come to love her spiritually. Establish group devotions and find accountability to better your prayer life. Being active in your diocese is necessary for personal holiness and bringing change to your area. Organize public prayer, webinars, and retreats. Protest, educate. Be militant. Resist. Sign up today before we lose tomorrow. There's a lot going on in the world and in the church right now, and the only answer is to simply stay faithful and fight. That includes plugging in and getting informed. Be sure and stay with us here at Church Milton as we bring you the truth that many others won't or simply can't. Remember the words of St. Catherine of Siena, Nothing great is ever achieved without much enduring. Pray the rosary, live in a state of grace, evangelize, and fight. That wraps up this week's Miked Up. Next week, we'll have on Father Donald Calloway, and he'll be discussing the breakdown of the family orchestrated decades ago by Marxists in an effort to undermine Western civilization. We'll see you then. God love you.